as the gallery is currently closed to the public, um, we're thrilled that Jimmy and Gallery Tanya Layton have allowed us to, to show this work online. And so I would recommend that uh, uh, if you haven't already to uh, have a chance to go onto the, the Glutzman website and, and, and see this piece. Um, also, be, we'll be screening a little excerpt of it um, to give a bit of context to today's uh, talk as well. Um, Jimmy, welcome. Um, Hi, just to let you, hiya. <laughs> <laughs> just to let everyone know, uh, Jimmy Robier is an artist uh, born in Guadeloupe and based in Berlin, and uh, who works in performance, photography, installation, and film. And his work uses the body to ask questions about how spaces are constructed and what it means to see and to be seen. His artworks are often formed through process of translation and transition, as he constructs meaning out of the differences that exist between various sites, texts, and media. Uh, his exhibitions, uh, previous and current exhibitions, include solo shows at Nottingham Contemporary, KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, and KAAI Theatre Brussels, and group exhibitions at uh, Glasgow International, which I, I know has now been moved back to 2021, I believe, um, as well as Chicago Architecture Biennial in 2019, uh, David Roberts Art Foundation, uh, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, and he's represented by uh, Tanya Leighton Gallery in Berlin, and Stichter van Doesburg in Amsterdam. Um, before we kick off, just to let everyone know uh, if it hasn't already happened for you to just mute your microphones and switch off your video, um, because we will be recording this, so uh, we don't want to make anyone into a YouTube celebrity or anything like that. Um, and if you have any questions for Jimmy uh, at any point throughout the talk, uh, please put them in the chat function, um, and I can ask them to, to him uh, uh, over the course of the conversation, uh, and we'll try and answer everything. Um, so thank you and welcome, Jimmy. Thank you, Claire, uh, Chris, <laughs> for the invitation. Very nice to meet you again, or actually meet you at all I for know. the first time. We've worked together in the past, a uh, long time ago, as we established earlier. So it's nice to, to be here and talk to you about this work in particular, and because it's got a lot to say about it. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Well, it's, it's definitely my pleasure. And as you say, we, uh, we, uh, we work back in 2011. So uh, um, mm -hmm. it's fantastic to be able to show your work here, here, in, here in Cork and talk to you. Um, and I wonder if maybe just to kick off the conversation today, um, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your beginnings as an artist and as a dancer and how your practice has developed from its initial stages and how you came to devise this kind of quite unique way of working, uh, which operates between, I guess, dance and performance, uh, film and installation, as well as drawing and photography. Right. So <laughs> I think it's... Uh... First, I never really considered myself a dancer, although I had this conversation uh, maybe with some dancers where they were like, yeah, but you are dancing, you are moving, so you're a dancer. And then maybe also because at some point when I first learned, for example, Trio A from Yvonne Rainer, uh, this uh, uh, postmodern dance uh, from Yvonne Rainer, which is meant to be a, a, a um, democratic dance that everybody can learn, everybody can learn. <laughs> uh, I, I was told by people who had been trained at dancers, like, how oh, dare you dance? Obviously, like, you know, we're talking about more than 15 years ago, but like, you know, how, how dare you dance? So I would just say, oh, I'm not a dancer, how dare I dance? You know, so there was this real sense of like, okay, things being very, uh, compartmentalized, let's say, and, you know, between dancers, non-dancers, who's an artist, who's a painter, who's a, an installation artist. And, and I would say as early as art school in uh, London, Goldsmiths in the 90s, we were not kind of put into these boxes. We were doing art, you know, and we were talking about art, and that included painting, that included performance, and uh, everything came through and everything was influencing everything. Everybody was influencing each other and it was more about ways of talking about what was produced that kind of allowed one to feel like they were uh, making things that were part of a conversation, a contemporary conversation, whether it was about art itself, but every field and how this, uh, this could kind of become a language and become a kind of vocabulary on the contemporary practice generally. Uh, so I come more from photography and uh, film, experimental film, and I was always interested in movement and maybe I wanted to be a dancer really. <laughs> but I guess what, what then this became, or what the practice became was maybe an answer to this um, 
any possibility of becoming a dancer or uh, this desire to be to be a dancer and not being a dancer. So equally, you know, responding to this desire towards dance, but in different forms, whether that is in writing or that is in uh, photography, image making, sculpture, um, and uh, eventually performance. I mean, this is it's still such a a key part of your practice as well when when I see exhibitions of work, but also sometimes utilize as kind of uh, materials or or props or elements of uh, the performance works themselves, and we'll see this in uh, Descendants as to new as well. But these in, these material objects, you know, the kind of sculptures, the kind of uh, photography, the drawings, even uh, they seem to have this interesting relationship to your performative work, and they exist somewhere, I think, between kind of documentation, kind of props, and almost like residual e elements or residue. Um, and how do you see these works in relation to your live performances? I mean, is there a, a, an element that comes first? Do you, do you kind of make work sometimes as 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 kind of props or tableau uh, for performances, or do sometimes the material works uh, maybe trigger something that's uh, that's more kind of live or more kind of dance related? Um, to kind of, it might be difficult to always um, uh, determine like the genealogy of, uh, of things, but I think very often things start in writing and reading and kind of accumu accumulating research about a certain topic and then very often, you know, I kind of leave it behind and then it grows or it finds also the right context and, and you know, so it's, I might be kind of thinking of an exhibition which, for example, doesn't work out for some reason or another, and then a few years later, I'm like, okay, this is the right context for it. For example, that is the case with Descendants du Nu, and the fact that it happened in this uh, former synagogue, uh, which is turned into an art space, it's very, very important in a way for giving the context to that work, but also expanding it and kind of, so sometimes, always to say that maybe sometimes when something is not happening, it's maybe not a bad thing because it's just also more time for it to develop. So meaning ideas around it, uh, meaning maybe the words that are being ref referenced. So very often it's starting from a, either an existing work or uh, wanting to work with a particular material or, or a prop or thinking of theatricality and how other works are also in, in kind of maybe answering some questions that are already at stake within a performance and it's like okay this didn't work out in this piece but maybe I can expand it in the next one and think how each piece is kind of responding to one another and explore new contexts, explore architecture, ways also that are kind of making the work um, expand also in its interpretation. For example, this Andres du Nuit was shown at the uh, Architecture Biennial which is a context that I was at first kind of, oh, I don't know if this is the right one, but eventually it was, it turned out to be very interesting also because um, I chose to show it in between like two staircases, grand staircases in this um, uh, community center. And so kind of interrupting the descent into like from, or the kind of uh, going up the stairs or down the stairs by having it on the kind of landing, which is a kind of awkward space for people had to sit in the staircase to look at it. So it was kind of, yeah, it's things are kind of dictated very often by like how to show them and who it would be kind of responding to them in a way and then think of like, so this idea of context and then the rereading of the artworks that are kind of in it. But to kind of think of it, to come back to your question and how things are kind of uh, thought out, I think it's very much about like, um, a combination of things in a way of like wanting to uh, have residues because also this question of performance is very important to me in a sense like okay is it something you do only once and then it's over which as a as an artist is also very demanding and very it's a lot of work to kind of every year kind of think of like okay a new performance a new performance I'm not in this kind of theater making mode where I can just you know produce constantly so it's like also uh, I think it's healthy to think about different ways of presenting things because it's different contexts, different interpretation. Each time things are different, each time you do a performance is different actually also. But to kind of break it into different elements and parts to kind of look at it as, as this object and then have this question like what is 
you know, a prop? Is it an object? Is it a sculpture? What is the performance itself? Also, can it be seen as an object that, you know, at different kind of angles can be turned around and can it be done by somebody else? And then what happens if it's performed by somebody else, which was the case at... Uh, in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago. Proxy or used for the dancers for the work, I believe, yeah. Yeah, I had five different people interpreting the piece that were like, uh, there was an audition and uh, very interestingly, there were five women. And so it was like there was a shift of gender and they were all trained dancers <laughs> also. And so, and so it was also about having this sense of trust, giving the work to somebody else and say, okay, I trust you to bring your own interpretation of it, but you know, what can you bring to the work that would make it unique? And evidently that were their personalities and, um, and each performer brought something very, very different to each time they performed. And that was very exciting also. Um, I think maybe um, we might just show a, an excerpt of, um, of that work as it was performed at um, CAC uh, Delmes, um, which is the, the film that we've been showing here as well, um, and the one that was later uh, reiterated into um, the, the piece in the Chicago Architecture Biennial. So um, we'll just show a, maybe a, a quick two-minute excerpt of that, and then we can come back and talk a little bit about uh, that, particular, uh, that particular film and that piece and that performance. So. Uh-uh. Hmm. Uh-uh. Hmm. Uh-uh. Um, so just a brief excerpt there of uh, De Cetonces to New, um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the title and its, its, its reference, of course, to uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, seminal uh, success to Scandal, uh, um, uh, New Descending a Staircase, uh, which of course caused uh, such commotion when it was first shown in, in 1912. And I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on the connection between this uh, particular art historical moment um, and the ways in which it, it determined or is read through the performance. Yes, I guess first it was, so uh, like I said a little bit before, it was uh, again the context that kind of determined a lot, although that piece I had in my mind already in terms of this figure of Marcel Duchamp, this big patriarchal figure and uh, in art and how it's kind of commanding a certain kind of authority and, um, and I was wondering, like, what is my relation to, to him simply, you know, as this kind of father figure in the art world? Is, it, is he also a father, a father figure for me? And as it seemed to be for, he seemed to be for many others. And so on one hand, it was kind of way of understanding or trying to understand his practice and how I related to it and his genealogies. And that's where the title comes from in a way. 
so descendance is like it's kind of it could be translated as both like inheritance and then uh yeah kind of yeah genealogy somehow and also kind of playing with the title like the new descending staircase so like uh descending from and so whatever this may mean and um so I wanted to kind of have him in this context also that is a kind of semi-religious context of a, you know, of, of a synagogue and, you know, there's still an altar in this, in this uh, art space and there's still some religious symbols. So I wanted to kind of think of him as this kind of, just like in religion, how then there's this kind of the, the role of patriarchy in religion and think of that in terms of art. Is art I'm not going as far as saying art uh, as a religion, but there is almost a kind of, you know, this is kind of, he has his authority in a sense, and what this may mean. And then, so the idea was to kind of really look at this painting, which was maybe the startup or the, the beginning of, of, of him being this kind of radical figure and how he kind of gained authority. Uh, and, um, and start by deconstructing already this image. Uh, and I knew it was problematic because it was like, you know, the birth of, birth of like cubism and like the beginning of mechanization and it's, everything is kind of the, the, the turn of like, of the, the turn all of the century is kind of happening already there, it's already represented in this image. So I wanted to kind of think of it in terms of movement already and how to deconstruct it as an image and render it and make it uh, a background. Uh, a prop, a theatrical prop, so it becomes a curtain in this space that we don't see in the video there, but it's a very, very large curtain. And then it's in relation to all, two other images that are also acting out as a kind of decor for the performance. So the performance in a way has to be read in relation to these images that are kind of framing it. And the performance is the only thing that escaped the frame in a way, because it's happening from one end of the building to the other. And it's just a crossing of like this frame again of uh, uh, the west to the east of the building. And it's a 10 meter line on the floor that I'm crossing. And I can't see anything with this thing on my head. And I have a piece of tape on the floor that guides me from one end to the, to the other that I have to feel so I don't get out of that uh, line. And for me, it's very much about positioning a body, a very specific body, this black body, in this relation to uh, this art history and how then I have to find a place within it. Where am I in this uh, history? And physically, uh, conceptually, and am I represented? And if I'm not represented, I'm, where am I in this kind of genealogy of the staircase? You know, am I at the, at the bottom of the staircase? Am I at the staircase? Uh, am I embodying the staircase? So I'm just kind of asking questions. I'm not answering any of them, but I'm suddenly also playfully kind of thinking, okay, this is also quite a grotesque situation and it's playful and it's, uh, uh, and the whole choreography is based on the series of movements that are coming from yoga, coming from various interests, uh, voguing or, posing and they're not even sometimes full movement they're just like poses but then it's how you transit from one pose to the next and then create a choreography by this by doing this <clears throat> i mean you've also spoken about i think this work and, and the props or the kind of sculptural elements as well it's having a, a relationship i guess to that next generation of appropriation art and particularly figures like sturtevant or um uh, louise lawler or shiri levine and and, and how do you feel in relationship to that lineage, I guess, this idea of Duchamp as maybe kind of triggering kind of a, a, a particularly feminist kind of reading of, of, of the ready-made, for example, or uh, um, uh, this notion of um, that dramatic gesture of Duchamp of kind of opening up, um, kind of expanding the canon in a way to accommodate uh, practices that maybe are a little bit divorced from kind of, you know, the patriarchal kind of Western uh, um, history that it has? I, I thought, I really see, I really saw uh, this female artist as the mothers in a way. And uh, I mean, they were around a bit in the discourses at art school and I was, I must say at the time struggling a bit to understand uh, the, some of the questions that were kind of asked or around their practices and must be maybe this question of originality and uh, uh, 
But again, maybe because I hadn't understood the lineage before and I was kind of unlike that reference in a sense. And they became for me references in the sense that uh, they had appropriated this work, you know, from these male figures to kind of find a place for themselves in this art history. And that became to me very important in terms of understanding is that what needs to be done to be understood as an artist or to have to validate one's patches or one's position in the art world to also appropriate and say, I understand this genealogy. I need to place myself into it to curve, carve a place for myself into it. Otherwise there's little chance of this happening or question, you know? And so, um, and this happened because I think very clearly once, uh, I kind of see a bit also the genealogy of this because I had made a film uh, much in 2006 that related to uh, Bastian Adder and his uh, disappearance, uh, the, 30, the 30th year of his disappearance at the time I was living in Amsterdam. And uh, I had made this very short film that's called, uh, also has a French title, <laughs> called The Sentimental Education, the Education Sentimentale. And in a way, it's, again, it's maybe sentimental or, I don't like the word nostalgic, but because it's kind of wrong, I think, in this context, but this way of like looking at art history by placing my body into it or in, in direct questioning or direct relation to this artist. And to be more specific, the film consisted in me being on a bicycle, no, a friend being on a bicycle and pretending to do this fall scene like the Bastian Adder films that are very short films, a bit tragic, comic films where he's on the bicycle and falls in the river, end of the film, in the canal, sorry. And so I ask a friend to be in this position as if he was about to fall in the canal and then just before he falls, I catch him. And then same thing, he's hanging from a tree branch and then falls down and then I catch him as well. So it's kind of this interferences in a way and kind of changing a bit the course well, of this kind of art history and by having these gestures and interferences or imagined dialogues or kind of uh, to and and the point I was trying to make with this is I felt that from having a conversation with someone at that point that they could understand what I was doing finally because there was this lineage and I was like okay all the other films that I've made before are not understandable because they don't have this uh, you know reference and I, I felt a little bit that that was a kind of moment of like okay so do I need to you know like validate my work through you know this this uh, this understanding and and of course it's I'm learning something from these artists and uh from their practice so that's what I meant by maybe not using the word nostalgia because it's not a nostalgia it's more like a kind of doing by or uh, understanding by doing which I think also I really believe is this is how you uh, make performance art you know, and I'm trying to be like teach now. Uh, I'm not trying, I'm teaching <laughs> as, as an artist also. And I really believe in this sense of like, um, you had to become a performance artist is by doing performances, you know, there's no other way. And so that I guess it's what's happening through, you know, these acts of uh, appropriation. <clears throat> learning. Well, I, I want to come back to this idea of the, kind of the intervention or, or the interruption, but um, I think just while we're, we're talking about this particular work, I also wanted to ask you about the sound component of it, which is, I think, remarkable. And this is a, a piece composed by, um, is it Ayn ba Bailey? I, I believe. Ayn Bailey, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also did the work, I think, for European portraits um, yeah. at, here um, in London, that piece. And with this kind of, these fractured, glitchy uh, female voices. And I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about the role of sound in this particular piece and maybe how this collaboration came about. And one thing I was really particularly intrigued to read about uh, the sound in relation to this performance was that the audio came from like an upstairs space uh, that was originally reserved for women in the old synagogue, uh, which I thought was kind of a fascinating little layer of kind of anecdote or information uh, that completely kind of switches around how you might think about a work like this. Yeah, totally, because so I've collaborated with Ayn a few times. We've known each other for a very long time. And she works mostly as a, as a sound artist. And uh, um, so when I investigated the space and I found out it was a synagogue, I asked, you know, what was then the function of like the, the space and how it was divided because there is a second floor and it's 
10 meters by 10 and also 10 meters high. So it's a very interesting space also in terms of sound, the way sound travels in it. And so very clearly there is this kind of uh, uh, upper space that, that looks down onto the lower space. And, and so I was told about this function and I was wondering you know, how to bring these voices back. So uh, I initially recorded all these voices in the locality of the, of the exhibition space uh, in Metz. The synagogue is a bit, uh, it's like a kind of 20 minutes drive from Metz, a city like in the east of France of Paris, sorry. <laughs> and, um, um, and then uh, I asked my friend Aileen if she wanted to make a composition, a sound piece that would then also remain in the space and occupy the space because the performance was not happening. Uh, just the performance happened only in, uh, during the opening. And to have this kind of bodily presence still there, this voice is resonating as a kind of absent body of the performance. And um, throughout the exhibition. Um, so the, the sound acts as a kind of background for the performance, but then also the reiterates this absence of bodies. And so, yeah, I wanted to really place these voices again where they were in the absence on this upper floor. So the speakers are on another level. And um, uh, I was kind of really interested in kind of, yeah, playing with this idea, this idea of like a language on the sense because they're not they're kind of what you call in French onomatopoeia. So like they're um, just utterances that are kind of not having a real meaning, but actually do. And kind of emphasize a bit, maybe also the grotesque or the funny part of the performance in a way. And, and, um, and yeah, so that was a very fun collaboration. I was really happy with the sound that um, I can come up with and uh, really happy to use it in this context. And also it resonates in, in the space like beautifully and it was echoing, the voices were then echoing throughout the whole building beautifully. Um, maybe we'll, I want to ask you about a couple of other projects and a couple of their exhibitions. Um, just to say to anyone who's watching as well that if you have any questions for Jimmy, please uh, put them into the chat function and I'll, I'll be very happy to ask. Um, but in the meantime, we kind of discussed a little bit at the outset, at, at the outset about uh, your show in Nottingham Contemporary, uh, a, a show called uh, Akimbo, um, which will be then touring uh, from Nottingham and it has been extended there until March, you were saying. Um, and so because of course the closures that have happened, uh, you had mentioned that there was a, a virtual reality uh, version of it, which I had a kind of a nice little wander around over the weekend. Um, and uh, I, I thought it was kind of fascinating. And of course it's, you know, it's no substitute for, for, for being there in some ways, but actually uh, certain things kind of really came, came through that navigation of this kind of virtual space. And one thing I was particularly struck by uh, was this way that you place or position um, physical objects, these kind of sculptural photographic works, mm -hmm. um, and the way that they almost kind of force the spectator to adjust their position or to move in a certain kind of way. Um, so in certain works, I'm thinking of uh, oh, oh, uh, one of the pieces, which was like kind of a, a ring of paper kind of uh, laid on the floor or, or it screens on the floor as well or projected onto tables. Um, and so you have to kind of squat or you have to kind of lean over, or you have to kind of move around spaces. And, and I was thinking like, I was wondering like, what role do you play in terms of the design of your exhibitions? I mean, obviously this is a, a key aspect of the works themselves. Um, and do you think of, you know, these exhibitions um, as a way of kind of choreographing the encounter of the viewer. Is that something that's important to you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, I think definitely in there, there is a, uh, something at heart, which is about not making things easy in the sense of like, this usual relation that one, usual uh, brackets, that one may have with images and uh, encountering an image and, this kind of face-to-face -face, uh, confrontation of this, uh, and how there's certain sense of rigidity in this. And to me, it's really important to be escaping that and questioning how we are approaching images and because it's not a given. It's also not, a, it's, it's uh, I'd like to amplify the fact that there might be some work to do, whether it's physical work or kind of conceptual work. And uh, that may not be, you know, asking for a lot, but it's just to kind of reiterate this, this notion of like, how do we position ourselves when we're looking at things? And, uh, and what is this position? And 
so whether it's like in terms of art history, whether it's in terms of privilege, whether it's in terms of uh, 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 art education or not, and but also you know height, and uh, so there are many different things that come into. Uh, uh, consideration whether the image is framed or not, and how that also makes it creates a distance between the surface and not. And there are things that I've al always been interested in terms of also making things more palpable, more touchable, or you know, if they are behind the frame, they're inaccessible, and if they come out of the frame, they're suddenly engaging into a physicality, and and they also kind of ha uh, highlighting a certain vulnerability because the paper or the image is very, very fragile. So what happens to an image when it's on the floor? And for, for some people I know dealing uh, uniquely with photography, it's like the ultimate kind of uh, outrage to have an image uh, on the floor because it's like, you know, it's sacred or something, you know, how it's, it deserves a certain respect. And for me, it's, I'm very, very interested in questioning this, this kind of, uh, which shall, forms of authorities as well and kind of, you know, if the image on the floor, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to walk on it, but then what happens if you do? And what are you thinking if you do that? I've witnessed people in installations where I have very pristine white paper on the floor at the uh, Je de Pomme in Paris, like consciously like stepping on it, like, look, I can do that. And then I was just like, okay, great. You've asserted your, like, <laughs> your authorship by stepping on a white pristine paper. And then what's next? You know, have you actually read what's on it? Are you, you know, looking at it? And it felt like it was just this desire like, to interact. I can mark a space and I've been there, you know, and I was there and I've seen the show, you know, like people kind of like putting their names on things. And it's the kind so of thing that gives me nightmares. <laughs> sorry, what? It's the kind of thing that gives me nightmares. Yes, exactly. You're doing that with the artwork. Right. Yeah, but I kind of like also then create this situation and I'm like, oh, okay, then maybe I'm not going to do it this way as well. It's an experiment, you know, sometimes. And then I'm just like, okay, maybe this is too vulnerable and this has been like, too exposed also to being broken or touched. And because very often people also want to touch things. And then, you know, so there's been a few anecdotes also whereby, you know, I had people like opening like artworks, you know, during openings, like unfolding them. And I was like, no, this is not a map. This is an artwork. You can't just take it like this. Or anyway, so that's also interesting and things to kind of like, you know, that I'm learning from also in terms of okay, what are my limits, you know, in terms of what I'm trying to do and what is uh, seen. Well, I mean, there are certain motifs you use as well that I can imagine would facilitate that kind of encounter. So even this idea of kind of the torn sheet of paper or the the, the smear that kind of goes off the paper onto the wall, uh, which becomes a little bit of an invitation. I think sometimes people go like, oh, maybe I'm not the first one here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this idea of the trace. I mean, it's really much the idea of the trace. I think that keeps coming back and how through, I mean, through tracing one is also marking their identity or their kind of passage through things. Like I was there, you know, it's like it's a bit this syndrome of like the, the key, uh, the, the lock of the bridge and all of this sense, you know, where the engravings and it's maybe a kind of primal thing also having to say I was there once, you know, and I have seen there and yeah, registering uh, presence. <laughs> Um, I have a question here from uh, Lucia Teubler, who says, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk about your work in an art historical context, unfolding the many layers and finding, carving your space in the genealogy of artists in the 20th century. Space, movement, sound, and history seem to be equally important in your work. How do you decide which spaces to take over? And then there's a second question after this as well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, it's a half and half so either it's a space i encounter or a, a space that i'm being kind of uh, invited to and then i feel oh okay i could really do something there or because i could it's uh maybe already loaded with a certain history or has or a sense of intimacy like the glass house of philip johnson for example which was his home for a long time and also functions as a museum and uh or or for example, in the case of the architecture biennial, I really approached them because I was, okay, thinking uh, I would love to do something in the context of an architecture biennial and what that would mean and to kind of have as a background more architecture than uh, visual art. 
and see how people are kind of then interacting with the work in this context. So sometimes I approach people, sometimes they approach me and then knowing a bit already like there's an interest then we try to find, you know, kind of a conversation and then see how uh, things can progress. And uh, so I'm very also sometimes interested in art spaces that are kind of unusual, uh, like the, the, the synagogue when I saw the history of, of uh, artists that I exhibited there and how that becomes a challenge in the sense. Uh, and even though it's a space that is really far out and a lot of people cannot see, it's almost inaccessible, you know, like so not so many people except the local people in the village, it's literally in a village, came to the opening and the, the, the lady is at the pharmacy, were like, oh, because I was ordering all these uh, things to wear like that I ordered at the pharmacy and they were really curious, so they came to the opening. So, you know, it's like um, very interesting to also have like these audiences that are maybe not also comforted with this kind of work to come and see it. And so I'm not shying away from a space that is like, you know, far, far away. It's quite interesting actually also um, to, to, to think of these challenges and like this decentralization uh, that is you know, happening a lot in France, for example, where a lot of art centers are away from Paris and not always easy to access, but still, you know, there and for people to see and generating a local audience. And that's uh, very interesting. Well, I mean, your, your point about, I guess, the, the collaboration that that entails um, kind of leads in the second part of the, the question here, which is about your choice to work with professional dancers. And are they performing freely or do they follow a particular choreography, which is practice indefinite? In a way, do you hand over the performance to the dancers and does that change your work? Um, I, I've had also some bad experience. <laughs> so I've learned also from that to kind of, uh, when I entrust people with the work to make it very clear that's what I'm doing and that they have a responsibility there, that they have to work within what the work is about and not add interpretive layers that are not in the work. And because I've had experience where people have done things that I were not happy about and that were not in the choreography and I was really, okay, I can't let this happen again because this is just changing the work completely. So I've learned to kind of have a, frame, a conceptual frame, and then I do then uh, uh, auditions where I find out more about people and how and why they want to interact with the work and what they see in it and what they can bring to it, which uh, has to really say within the conceptual frame of the work. And what they bring into it is generally very small things, but that are about their uh, educational uh, dance experience. And everybody has a very different way of like moving and all these different bodies. And it was really interesting because all dancers had the masks on. So then there was really all this uh, interpretation side of the face, which was gone. And therefore they had to render interpretation through only movement. Their personality came only through movement. And the five dancers had very, very different ways of approaching the, the same piece. And although I had a, I would say, a, it was not a strict choreography, it was open in terms of, what they could do, they, they managed to confuse it with very, very special uh, um, uh, traits each time. Um, I want to talk maybe a bit about uh, some of the other pieces that you, you've touched on as well. Um, and, and particularly this idea of how the representation of black and queer bodies is, is so integral to your practice. Um, and particularly I was thinking of the work uh, from 2019, uh, Joie Noir uh, at KW Institute for Contemporary Art in, in Berlin a piece you performed with the uh, dancer uh, Courtney Henry and a work which has multiple layers of references, I think filtered all through it. So I think people like Arthur Mitchell, who's co-founder of the Dance Theatre of Harlem, um, David Hemmings' uh, uh, 2002 light installation Concerto in Blue and Black, uh, which is kind of uh, finds its way in through this kind of blue saturated light for the piece, um, as well as music from you know, Sylvester, uh, Grace Jones, uh, even the Smiths, I don't really want to get into the, <laughs> the ramifications of the Smiths almost in, in this context. But, uh, and it was also work that was a tribute to your late collaborator, collaborator uh, artist, writer, and curator, uh, Ian uh, White, who had, you, you had a very long collaboration with as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if maybe you can talk a little bit about how you orchestrate uh, these various re reference points. And is there an overall effect that you strive for when you're kind of fusing the, these disparate kind of points or elements together? Yeah, I guess the, the, the pleasure comes in actually uh, 
getting these things together as a whole and however distant they may be to kind of uh it's a bit like editing, you know, editing. I really much see it as like either editing a film or editing lines in a text and where you kind of just juxtaposing things one after the other until you create a whole that has, makes sense. And the idea is really to see or how fluid one element can be to the point of like merging with the other seamlessly and not appear like there are such different things. And it's also maybe also pointing at this different ideas of like what is high art and what is low art and for example in this piece i was really interested in bringing the ballet the culture of ballet to in connection to the culture of night clubbing and also um uh because uh, in in his book um uh before pictures oh i have a blank now uh douglas cream <laughs> in his biography separates very much like his his, his uh disco culture to, from his uh, ballet culture in the two different chapters but they nonetheless presented one after the other and and for me it was really kind of a pleasure to try to bring these two worlds together in one and kind of see the similarities in the differences or you know and kind of um, uh, so with uh, with Courtney and I, I kind of got images from this Balanchine ballet called Egon that features Arthur Mitchell and I was really interested in reproducing some of his images so we worked only from images and juxtaposing images we created a choreography just out of images from the ballet so we just go from one image to the next and so everything I would say is very much image driven so this background in photography is still kind of coming back in performance in the sense that uh, it's about creating images and then how then you, like I said, in, in image or in filmmaking, how do you move from one image to the next? And then it's that this fluidity of movement from one image to the next that creates like maybe the whole final image. How do you move from one sound piece to a, 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 a dialogue? Uh, and so, for example, like um, I'm taking, a, the French text from uh, Grace Jones songs and they become a bit like a monologue and, um, and so transforming them also like shifting also maybe their, their uh, uh, initial function so they're not meant to be like theatricalized in this sense but the way she uses them in the song is so it's like why not then you know in that sense and uh, give, giving removing them from their context and then it just sounds like a kind of French monologue but actually they're they're like, uh, they have something very dramatic and very filmic also about them. So it's, yeah, something between film and photography, this kind of stillness. And the same with the, the glass house, I approached it very much also like a film, although it was a performance with framing and scenes and music and, uh, and text in a way, and it's kind of fragmentation. <clears throat> well, that's, that's another work I wanted to ask you about. Uh, this is a piece you did for, for Performa, I think it was in 2017. And, in uh, Philip Johnson's uh, Glass House in uh, New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, and it's uh, quite a striking kind of piece because um, on one way, I mean, there's, you know, you had mentioned this earlier, this idea of kind of the intervention or the kind of intrusion. Um, and there are kind of really remarkable kind of moments there where you see this shift from uh, yourself and, and one of your collaborator dancers moving from something that is almost like a security guard <laughs> A kind of role uh, with this kind of application of lipstick or also this kind of uh, recurring motif of being inside and outside of the glass of, 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 of the building as well. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, I guess, I don't really know how to phrase this, um, but this notion of uh, you know, the black queer body as something that is obviously an integral part of art history, of cultural history, um, but also a sense that you're kind of maintaining its kind of radicality. Um, that um, it's appropriation within kind of a, a normative uh, Western art history um, is something that um, isn't necessarily something to be fought for, but actually to maintain the kind of keep the sense of kind of otherness or alterities it feels to me like something that kind of permeates a work like that. I'm even thinking about the there's a closing scene in that performance where uh, when the performer speaks about a house that I have invaded, and it just has this kind of very kind of powerful sense of of uh, there's kind of a reckoning there, a kind of a historical reckoning of finding, uh, you know, I mean, obviously I know Philip Johnson, of course, the piece relates to uh, Jimmy Daniels, the Harlem Renaissance cabaret singer, and of course Johnson's lover as well. But it's like this kind of moment of kind of reckoning of saying, okay, now there's a place in this house, an acknowledgement of that place. 
Um, I don't know if I found a bearded question in there. That's so. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, to see whether. Um, yeah, I guess it's. Um, I think it's just not very far from what I was talking about earlier in terms of this kind of this notion of intersectionality in the sense of like, you know, class, gender, race, and trying to position oneself in terms of, you know, art history, but position also oneself in terms of this architecture icon, it's, you know, this, this is a, an iconic piece. And then I'm just thinking, you know, of the US at the time, the Black Lives Matter movement, and then the idea of visibility, who, you know, who lives in Connecticut, who lives in that particular neighborhood, and, you know, there's absolutely no Black visibility. And uh, it, it was, I felt instantly, okay, I love this place, and because I think it can, it can really trigger a lot of uh, images again, and then how, like for example, a simple figure like the hooded figure becomes a, maybe something, an image of threat or desire. It's ambivalent, you know. It's kind of both, and in this kind of super kind of um, uh, suburban dream of openness and visibility, where actually, well, you kind of also wonder how could a gay man in the 1950s live in a transparent house? You know, it's just all this kind of ambivalent kind of situation. So. I'm commissioned to do a work in an, in an area where there is absolutely no black visibility and it's very transparent and it's like a commission work. And then you just like, okay, what kind of anxiety could that generate? You know, also for me, you know, and it's in the sense of, you know, you, you can't just wander around and, you know, feel like, you know, everything is going to be fine. You know, it's like your body could be very vulnerable in this sense, you know, exposed and feel like, okay, why well, somebody could ask you what you're doing there. And, you know, I wouldn't have an answer for that or my answer would, might not be satisfactory. So then it's kind of being aware of all this and then it's still um, um, uh, being motivated by that to kind of create something that could be not necessarily, maybe highlighting these questions, not necessarily answering them, but also um, enjoying kind of putting them to the surface and kind of through forms, and by, through the playing of forms and through the kind of, uh, uh, the creation of some form. So whether that is a, a, a body choreographing some movement outside of the glass house and inside, and what then this means to create this inside and outside of the house. And, um, uh, but also to, you know, say a poem by Audrey Lorde and having this really, really intimate moment and this question of intimacy that are not maybe also, uh, uh, investigate it enough in terms of maybe, um, uh, uh, I would say, black representation in their possibilities and then why. And, you know, so asking yourself all these questions and try to, um, yeah, kind of just present them, put them out there and then see, because I'm, I'm not sure necessarily, I'm, uh, because, you know, I was also asking, you know, uh, things to do with uh, Josephine Baker at some point we're singing like this song from Josephine Baker and uh, I feel she's also this really really uh, amazing figure which has also caused some controversy but nonetheless interesting because of um, maybe the risk you know they have taken and the question that they've raised and same with Grace Jones and that's why it was also so exciting to be in this show at uh, Nottingham which uh, next door to my exhibition, there was a show dedicated to uh, Grace Jones and and these uh, female figures and the many many questions they've had, they've asked and that still remain kind of unanswered and and nonetheless were very very fruitful to kind of raise the question of the subject you know and subjectivity and um, and um, yeah so. I was, uh, I think I'm still kind of in the middle of all of this. I'm still trying to work it out, like even for myself, in terms of, you know, what can I do? And uh, uh, and I guess again, it comes. The answer comes through making, and uh, the 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 image might become more clear as I go along and as I make more work. And um, but still not answered. <laughs> But I think, like, I mean, I think that's a, a fantastic way to look at the kind of working through these kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. I also think the pairing of uh, your exhibition with with Grace Jones is actually quite an inspired one, and uh, and of course it would happen at a time when we're all in lockdown. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but something to look forward to for next yeah. next year. And um, just before we come to a close, I, I had a, a kind of a last thing I want to ask you, and this was really about, um, I guess, our current situation um, mm -hmm. with the lockdown restrictions and how that's impacted on your work. And I wonder if, 
and, and maybe it, it has had no effect, but ha how has the, or has the global pandemic and the kind of consequent reliance on say digital screens as a means of communication, mm -hmm. how, how has that affected the way you might think and enact the body as a medium of expression? Has that made you kind of think about or kind of consider or reconsider um, that notion of uh, bodily expression um, when it has to be kind of filtered through um, a Zoom conference or a Skype yeah. or, or through video? Okay. So first I have to say that I'm still in the process of doing that. <laughs> this is not over, you know, because I think that's something that is asked and I realized when, when we had to shift to the online format where everybody was jumping on it and say, oh yeah, we can do theater online, we can do cinema online, we can do teaching online. And then suddenly I was imagining this person like spending their time in front of their computer. And I was like, well, no, like that generated to me a lot of anxieties in the sense of um, what can I do? What can I actually do? How can I do this? Can I do this? And uh, so I, I think I'm just starting to get into it just really now and like, oh yeah, this is actually, you know, interesting and we can still discuss, we can create, um, it's a form, it's a new form and I think I'm, I, it takes time to get used to. And uh, I've done a workshop at the university with my students one day, like maybe like seven hours online of performance. And I was like, oh, this is really tiring. <laughs> this is really, really exhausting because the attention, you know, kind of also trying to see if people were like there, their presence was really hard to monitor on this format. And so there are lots of perceptions that are missing to, to, to allow to uh, oneself to sense the other and sense their attention and sense their participation or their involvement in things. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, uh, we're lucky we have it, you know, that we can have this technology at all. And that we, you know, I can't imagine, you know, like the pandemic like 10 years back, you know, and how we would have had to kind of deal with all of this in a way. So it's kind of an in-between where I'm like, okay, uh, it's hard and you need to get used to it. And it's another where I'm thinking, okay, we're lucky we have it at all. But in terms of, uh, um, so I think it's really good, really to, in terms of just, keeping a conversation going and keeping things alive in a sense and whether it's just through the discursive from a point of view of like looking and watching and experiencing things I think it works you know for some format better than some others but you know uh, uh, but I also get surprised is also like where I think oh okay this actually was interesting and so to kind of think of it creatively well from on a personal level is still taking some time, but that's maybe just, you know, me and my personality in a sense, but um, uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've definitely risen to the challenge today, Jimmy. <laughs> um, and I just want to say a, a, a very warm thank you uh, for, for today's talk. Um, one thing as well I, I forgot to mention at the outset is, of course, we are screening the film um, online at the moment, but actually um, Jimmy's also attached in the chat function there a uh, a PDF of a commissioned text by Elizabeth Lebovici that accompanied um, Descend also to new. Um, so um, by all means, please have a look at that and the film as well. Um, yes. <coughs> oh, sorry. No. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add something that is, yeah. if you see the film, it's important to see also the set because that's what we were talking about. And you might not see it at the beginning, but more maybe in the middle of the, of the film to see the images that are accompanying the, the, the performance. Um, and uh, the text of, uh, of Elizabeth Lebovich was like a program though, that you could just take out as you visited the space. So that's why I attach it to this as well. So then you have the full experience of the work. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just to say to everyone as well that um, thanks for attending today. Um, our next uh, online talk um, as part of our curatorial conversations uh, program will take place at 1 p.m. on December 3rd. Uh, this is a conversation between Glucksman director Fiona Kearney and uh, Sophia Hernandez Chongqui, who is the uh, director of the institute formerly known as Bit the Bit in Rotterdam, uh, now is going to be uh, called the uh, Kunstinstitut Meli. Uh, so uh, you're all welcome to, to join us then, and including yourself, Jimmy, if you want to uh, uh, come along. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let me just say once again, uh, very many thanks, Jimmy, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice to see you again. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.